Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the talk, um, Cold War Reckonings in the Shadow of Solzhenitsyn. Uh, my name is Chang. I am a PhD student in Literatures in English, and I'll be your facilitator of the talk today. I'd like to first thank Cornell East Asia Program for hosting this event and for Department of Literatures in English and Asian American Studies Program for co-sponsoring. Um, and of course, thank you, Professor Jenny Kim Watson for joining us today on Zoom and for your talk. Um, so Professor Jenny Kim Watson is Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature at New York University. In addition to Cold War Reckonings, uh, published um, in 2021 by Fordham University Press. She is the author of The New Asian City, Three Dimensional Fictions of Space and Urban Form. She has also co-edited with Gary Wilder, the collective volume, The Post-Colonial Contemporary, Political Imaginaries for the Global Present. Um, as you may have um, noticed, the talk portion of this event will be recorded and made available um, later. And after the talk, we will also have a Q&A um, session. So please write your Q&A in the chat or raise your digital hand for questions after the talk. So I'd like to welcome Professor Watson um, and start the event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. And it's, uh, it's just a real delight to be here virtually, of course. Um, thank you, Amala um, and Bonnie for all the work you did for organizing and advertising this event. And I really couldn't be more thrilled um, to be here um, and having this conversation. Um, uh, and thank you to the East Asia program and to the other sponsors for the, for the talk and for everybody to, for coming out on your first afternoon of spring break. Um, so thank you. Uh, so let me let me share my screen and I'll um, get started. Okay. Is that good? Okay, great. Um, so what I'm going to do is speak uh, for the first about 15 minutes. I'm going to give a kind of an overview of the book and uh, the, of uh, Cold War Reckonings and some of the motivations and what I hope some of the interventions are. And then in the second half or the rest of the talk, I'm going to be drawing from the second chapter of the book on dissident literature to give you a bit of a sense of the kind of textual and historical arguments that I'm making. And I should be speaking for about 45 minutes. Um, so let me start with uh, kind of the unofficial backstory of the project. So this is this is what you're not going to read in the book. Um, the first, the, the version of this story is somewhat personal um, and the entry point is the late 1990s when I was a recent college graduate living and teaching in South Korea in the southwestern provincial capital city of Gwangju at Chonnam University, Chonnam National University. It was my first experience living outside Australia and I was excited to get to know the country of my mother's origin. Before going there, I thought I knew at least the basics of modern Korean culture and history, largely garnered through my own family's experience. My grandparents had lived through the Japanese colonial period. My grandmother was partly educated in Japan. My mother, Tasu Kim Watson, was a child living in Pyongyang when the Korean War broke out. Like tens of thousands of others fleeing the violence, she and her family fled their home and undertook the journey to the south southern port city of Busan before later settling in Seoul. In a subsequent Cold War moment, my Australian father, the late Keith Watson, spent time in South Korea in the 1960s doing humanitarian work with the American Friends Service Committee, a Quaker organization. And he was partly drawn there out of curiosity about the two political systems dividing the peninsula. All to say, I had already had some understandings of the Cold War in Asia, since it had quite literally been part of my, my family story. Um, but when I arrived in Gwangju in 1998, what I wasn't expecting was that I would be so ignorant about the South's decades of military dictatorship, and in particular, my ignorance about one of its most violent episodes, uh, the Gwangju uprising of 1980 in which the military slaughtered hundreds of civilians who were protesting the transfer of power from one military dictator, Park Chung-hee, to another, John Duan. Uh, 
But drawing on my training in architecture, which was my first undergraduate degree in Australia, I ended up writing my first book, The New Asian City, on the particular configuration of post-coloniality in places like South Korea, Taiwan and Singapore, where colonial legacies, rapid industrialization and anti-communism were crystallized in a kind of rapidly transforming metropolis that helped create the first generation of Asian tigers. Over the years, I came to realize that while most people outside the peninsula had had heard of Korea's economic success, you know, it's um, Asian tiger reputation, but I came to realize uh, they hadn't heard about the dictatorships or the violence of Gwangju 1980 or other similar moments of authoritarian state violence in non-communist Asia. The white terror period in Taiwan, Operation Cold Store in Singapore, the mass killings in Indonesia in 65, and the list could go on all in countries that were staunch Western allies in the fight against tyranny of the communist, against the tyranny of the communist bloc. So Cold War Reckonings came about partly as my attempt to explore the residues and legacies of these political formations by addressing stories that have not been as widely told about them. So that's sort of the more personal version. Let me now switch to the official version of motivations of for the book and I'll speak here a little bit about field formations um, and disciplines. So at its broadest level I wanted to push back on the still pervasive Cold War thinking that insists on pairing liberal democracy with capitalism and conversely authoritarianism with the communist world and that's not to say of course that the communist bloc uh, did not or does not have its fair share of authoritarianism but that the hard binary between them is itself a product of the Cold War. And you can think here, you know, right now at sort of, you know, at the, the, the kind of examples of, of some of the thinking around, you know, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine as something of a repri reprise of, you know, Soviet authoritarianism and so on. In particular, I wanted to address a regional formation of political rule that I felt hadn't been adequately accounted for in my field of training of post-colonial studies, namely those US aligned non-communist free world Asian regimes. And although post-colonial literary studies and cultural studies has been very interested in the long shadow of colonial governance, colonial epistemes, liberation struggles, as well as the disappointments of post-colonial national projects, it seemed that East and Southeast Asia are very often excluded from its purview, partly for language reasons and partly, I think, because they don't conform to the post-colonial trajectories typically seen in South Asia, Africa or the Caribbean, which are its usual sites of study and simply applying the lessons of those other regions, which I did try to do at the early stages of this project, was less than satisfactory. Um, a sort of breakthrough came for me when I started reading the work of scholars like Honik Kwon, Odani Westad, Jody Kim, Lisa Yonayama, Monica Popescu, Quan Xing Chen and others, who enabled me to start grappling, grappling with the entanglements of Cold War uh, and decolonization in Asia a perspective that post-colonial studies has only recently started to embrace. Free world authoritarianism in the region, I realized, hadn't been visible partly because of the durability of Cold War boundaries of freedom and unfreedom, while in post-colonial studies, the region had largely been left off the map. Um, so what does Cold War Reckonings do? It looks at cultural production on and of four Cold War illiberal regimes, Park Jung-hee's South Korea, Ferdinand Marcos's Philippines, Suharto's Indonesia and Lee Kuan Yew's Singapore, in order to tell a more complicated story of what unfreedom looked like in the free world. It goes beyond narratives of non-Western political immaturity and Confucian capitalism to give an account of the unfolding of decolonization through the matrix of the Cold War. I approach these questions by looking at two sets of cultural producers. The first set are those writing during the Cold War period proper, and the second, those who look back on the de those decades from closer to our contemporary moment. How, I ask, have they conceptualized, analyzed, represented, and contested the political cultures of these Cold War autocratic states? As I say in the introduction, the book argues for the ability of imaginative texts to dislodge a number of conceptual certainties, of authoritarianism there and freedom here, of the assumed temporal boundaries of colonial versus post-colonial or Cold War versus post-Cold War, 
and notions of repressive state control versus economic liberalism, assumptions we've inherited from both post-colonial and Cold War epistemes. Together, the texts I analyze take us from tyrannies of colonial domination to dictates of developmentalism through narrative genres that experiment with and reflect upon foreclosed futures of the past and sedimented histories of our supposedly post-Cold War present. Unplug your phone. Oh. You are at 100% battery. Sorry. <laughs> okay, my battery's full. Um, um, so how, I ask, have they conceptualized, analyzed, uh, represented and contested the political cultures of these Cold War autocratic states? Um, sorry, I went backwards there. Um, okay. Um, and it is for these reasons I consider them genres of Cold War reckoning. My title is an attempt to capture both the tensions at a specific geopolitical conjuncture and the gesture of settling accounts with the past. Now let me say a bit more about the methodology and the interventions that I hope the book to be making. And I've got five brief points here. Um, first is my use of the Cold War. To be clear, the book does not aim to recenter the US or Soviet Union by bringing in the Cold War as a key term. Rather, I'm interested in the complications in decolonization and nation building that were brought about by both bipolarism and its violence. So my use of the term Cold War is not the more common one of the ideological superpower between the US and the Soviets. And I actually presume my, the audience today already knows this. Um, instead, we could say it is the set of global conditions created by the great powers in response to the demands of decolonization. In other words, as Odd Arnie Westad has shown us, what was most at stake in the Cold War was precisely the battle over the making of the Third World. And it is, of course, only a Cold War, a standoff that didn't erupt into open conflict from a North Atlantic perspective. In some locations of the decolonizing world, it was a conflict that involved mass violence, total war, and millions of casualties. In an interview before his death, Pramudia Anantatur, the Indonesian writer I'll be discussing further in the talk, perfectly describes this understanding of the Cold War. Speaking of the Vietnamese and Indonesian declarations of independence in August 1945 that initiated a period of freedom struggles, he says, quote, in reaction against these anti-colonial independence movements, the Northern countries began the Cold War, end quote. So you can see how he's totally uh, shifting the, the center of the Cold War from you know, the Western North Atlantic dimension to the focus on anti-colonial struggles and decolonization. Second uh, is my emphasis on decolonization itself. This allows me to consider post-colonial formations beyond the vertical relationship of colonizer colonized or the residues of colonial epistemes and power formations, as much as it remains vital, of course, to understand these. The focus of decolonization on historically embedded transformation challenges the neat temporal border between colonial and post-colonial. As a number of scholars have discussed, decolonization is best understood as both an exit and an entry a sometimes revolutionary exit from formal colonial rule, but also an entry into a new world order in the making, as Christopher Lee has put it. Consequently, many of the texts I write about are profoundly interested not only in the legacies of colonial rule, but in the nation's insertion into, an, into a post-war international order and the violence this entails. Third, a word about literature and the role of aesthetics in the book. Cold War reckonings are centrally organized around the question of post-colonial authoritarianism as a representational problem. Both Frederick Jameson and Gugiwa Thiongo, the great Kenyan writer, have described the crisis of unclarity that happens with native dictatorships, pointing out that critiques against such states are not going to say, take the same aesthetic forms as those of the liberation struggles against a foreign colonizer. The book takes up these questions by asking how literary or filmic genres mediate the genre of rule, to use Anne Stoller's term, of free world authoritarianism. So for example, in chapter one, I look at regional pen writers conferences as a kind of Cold War decolonizing genre. In chapter two, which I'll be speaking from in a moment, I consider the category of dissident literature. In later chapters, I think about the Buildings Roman as a genre of decolonization. 
Uh, that's in chapter three, where I read three novels by Jeremy Tiang, Mohammed Latif Mohammed, and Sunny Liu. In chapter four, I'm interested in anachronism as a trope through which to think about a film by Tan Pin Pin and a novel by Hong Suk Young. And in chapter five, I consider the use of the Truth Commission as a literary and filmic genre and as a way to question certain hegemonic temporalities of the post-Cold War. And there I'm looking at a novel by Han Gang and films by Joshua Oppenheimer. By and large, the book offers readings that emerge from those on the quote unquote wrong side of history. That is from leftists, communists and radical nationalists who were imprisoned, exiled or repressed by the right wing regimes of their time but whose imaginaries might still offer us transformative possibilities for our present. Fourth, the method of the book is deeply comparative. Almost every chapter brings together different sites in different configurations from the, from the four um, sites that I look at. And it was very important to me that the book be so comparative. In some ways, being my second book, I also had the luxury of not staying in the lane of my own training, which is, of course, the opposite of what we're told to do and what I presume some of you are being told right now. But it allowed me to engage more broadly and I think more productively across Anglophone postcolonial studies, global Cold War studies, East Asian and Southeast Asian studies, um, and especially the latter two, which I think are not put in conversation often enough. Um, but this also required that I work partly in translation. So I do work in translation for the Indonesian texts. Engaging with theorists from Franz Fanon to David Scott and Hannah Arendt further helped me broaden my thinking. While my focus on the epistemologies and genealogies of anti-communism in the latter part of the book also brings in comparisons with Latin America and the Cold War experience uh, in other regions. And fifth, and perhaps most ambitiously, I think of the book as trying to provide an alternative historiography of the present, one that centers East and Southeast Asia, but also links the region to larger narratives and processes of global decolonization. In that sense, I see Cold War reckonings as not only telling a different story about decolonization from the ones that have dominated post-colonial studies, but as also telling a new story of the post-war consolidation of capitalism that has led to our current age of neoliberal hegemony. So at the largest level of argument, the book reveals how post-Cold War neoliberalism and the accepted models of economic development for the global South have been predicated on the elision of Cold War violence. The book makes a case, in other words, for the ongoing relevance of global decolonization for understanding and critiquing contemporary political and economic forms. Okay, so that was the kind of overview of the book. Um, and now I will move to the second part um, where I'm gonna draw from chapter two in the shadow of Solzhenitsyn. Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn published his best known work, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich in 1962. Composed while he was in prison in Stalin's labor camp system, the novel quickly became a touchstone of Cold War dissident writing. Founded a year earlier in 1961, Amnesty International would become crucial to publicizing such dissident work. And by the late 1960s, the organization began naming a number of political prisoners for its annual Prisoner of Conscience Week. In 1972, these included Indonesia's best known writer, Pramudia Anantatoa, alongside an anti-Castro doctor in Cuba, a Taiwanese satirist, and two Roman Catholic priests, one in South Africa and the other in Hungary. In a New York Times article of, of November 1972, Ivan Morris, professor of Japanese at Columbia University and spokesperson for Amnesty International, spoke of the organization's appeal to UN Secretary General Kurt Waldheim to assist in freeing the 12. Morris states, quote, more and more countries are turning to police methods, suspending human rights, making arrests without charges and torturing prisoners, end quote. Ramudia, who was in prison for 14 years from 1965 until 79 by the Suharto government, is referred to in a number of articles as the Indonesian Solzhenitsyn. Other international campaigns included the Committee to Save Kim Chi Ha, a group formed by Japanese academic Tsurumi Shunsuke. The committee sought international publicity for Kim, the South Korean poet who was jailed and later sentenced to death after publishing his withering satire of the Park Chung-hee regime, Five Bandits. 
or Ojak, in 1970. In 1973, Tsurumi traveled to Seoul with a petition signed by notable figures, including Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Alex Laguma, Oe Kenzaburo, and Herbert Marcuse. As they did with Pramudia, the international press referred to Kim as the Korean Zoltanitsyn. Uh, finally, although lesser known than the other two writers, Filipina journalist and writer Ninochka Roska was detained along with hundreds of others by the Marcos government during its sweeping 1972 crackdown on journalists and writers. Her novel on the Marcos regime, State of War, though published in 1988, derives a number of its plots and character sketches from short stories conceived during her imprisonment in the notorious Camp Crane in 1972. In a 2012 magazine article, Lourdes Godolan interviews a number of writers who had been detained at that time and wonders about the paucity of Philippine literature documenting the period. And she asks, quote, why is there no one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich for the Philippine experience, end quote. So I'm interested in these three cases of Asian Sultanitsyns for the way they confirm the figure of the imprisoned dissident writer as one of the most recognizable tropes of Cold War authoritarianism. Why exactly does the fate of prisoners of conscience and the genre of dissident literature in particular become such a flashpoint for diagnosing unfreedom during the Cold War? Given the appellations of Indonesian or Korean Sultanitsyn, what is occluded when the second and third worlds are collapsed in an assumed shared condition of tyranny, despite obvious variations in the political orientations of those regimes, communist, socialist, capitalist, pro-West, non-aligned, etc. And how has a Cold War lens shaped the way we view typical genres of dissident literature, such as historical allegory, political satire, and the novel of resistance? Um, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm cutting out a section here in which I look at the construction of dissident literature during the, this Cold War conjuncture. And in particular, I look at the, the amnesty campaign um, and how the defense of prisoners of conscience uh, is often couched in terms of literary value. Uh, so the refusal to adapt their writing to the oppressive state um, become sort of reworked as a, as a kind of freedom of literature. Um, so this genre of dissident literature is what I'm sort of arguing is, is best expressed as the unyielding of an individual's artistic expression to third world or Soviet state pressure. Or as I say in the chapter, literature itself becomes persecuted. Um, however, what I'm also arguing is that the writings of Pramudia, Kim and Roska disclose a form of authoritarianism conceived less as the violation of an individual's expression or subjectivity by the state and more in the historical complication of national sovereignty in the entry to trans-Pacific capitalism. In Joseph Slaughter's analysis, amnesty type campaigns sought to introduce a third character, world opinion, into the two-person drama of political imprisonment to interpose public opinion between the state and the individual. In contrast to this, I suggest that the three writers that I focus on recast this drama entirely. They arrogate literature to the more ambitious and perhaps riskier role of theorizing the complex historical and material entanglements of the colonial, neo-colonial and bipolar. Okay, so I'm now just going to read some very abbreviated sections from the part uh, on both Prabudia and Kim to, to give you a little uh, sense of what I'm what I'm doing there. Um, but I don't have time to, to do the Roska section, unfortunately. So uh, first, um, Pramudia. Uh, set in the early 20th century, the historical realist novels of Pramudia's Buru Quartet were famously composed while he was incarcerated on Buru Island in the 1970s. His 14-year detention followed the coup and mass anti-communist killings of 1965 to 66, which installed Suharto as the president. The immediate cause of Pramudia's imprisonment was his involvement with the leftist culture, cultural group LECRA, which is a, an acronym for Lombarda Kubadaya An Rakyat, or Institute of People's Culture. The four novels of the Buru Quartet were all subsequently banned for their supposed promotion of Marxist-Leninist ideas. Um, so in fact, they circulated more in the English language version than in the Indonesian version for some time. 
As those familiar with the tetralogy know, the book centres on the character of Minke, the, a young aristocratic, aristocratic native who comes of age around the turn of the 20th century, attains a European education, comes gradually to reject the superiority of European civilization and is instrumental in the awakening of the Dutch East Indies towards a nationalist consciousness. The character of Minky is closely based on the journalist Turto Adi Surio, who lived from 1880 to 1918, reflecting Pramudia's efforts to restore to historical memory this pioneering nationalist. Through Minky, Pramudia's detailed descriptions of the new journals, newspapers, trains, and common language, the use of the lingua franca Malay, today's Bahasa Indonesia, brings together the hitherto fragmented spaces of the Indonesian archipelago into a profoundly new sense of world historical modernity. By the fourth novel, House of Glass, Rumakacha, however, the first person narrative of Minke, our exemplary witness to history, gives way to that of Jacques Pangamanan. Pangamanan is a native police commissioner who rises to become a valued expert on native affairs employed at the Dutch General Secretariat and who is tasked with surveilling and repressing the burgeoning native political organisations. Minky, meanwhile, is exiled to Ambon during early in the novel and effectively remains off stage for the five year duration of the narrative. Like Minky, the historical Turto, Turto was exiled to Ambon in the remote Maluku Islands, not far from Buru. And so you can see both Buru and Ambon on this map. Um, New Guinea is to the east, and you can just see the tip of Sulawesi on, on to the northwest. With Minky removed from the narrative, we instead follow our anti-hero, Pangamanan, and his rise and fall as he is tasked with monitoring and suppressing the emerging local organisations, especially the Sarakat Islam, or the Islamic Union, founded by Minky. So, so just to emphasize that this novel, unlike the first three, completely sidelines Minky and we have Pangamanan as the narrator and the sort of anti-hero. The allegorical dimensions of the novel are hard to miss. The repressive Dutch state that exiles and censors Minky's work obviously evokes the new order's regimes, uh, the new order regime's arrest of Pramudia and hundreds of thousands of others in the name of anti-communist national security. Peter Hitchcock rightly identifies a double time of the novel, which layers the 1910s with the 1960s to 80s. Most troublingly, where the previous three novels seem to chart the inexorable rise of anti-colonial nationalist consciousness, the final novel would seem to constitute a rolling back of such a movement toward liberation. House of Glass thus seems to confirm the very two-person drama of repressive state and dissenting individual I mentioned earlier. Benedict Anderson, commenting on the novel's unusual narrator, describes Pangamanan as, quote, the file keeper and file contaminator of the glass house, who is also the ultimate narrator and a dystopic prolepsis, end quote, foreshadowing the unfreedoms to come under the Suharto regime. Read as an allegory for the later regime, the novel pointedly asks its readers, who are the new tyrants? Yet Pramudia's final novel is much more than a proleptic augur of the New Order's unfreedoms. Rather, House of Glass explicitly asks the question of political and social reproduction. On closer examination, we find that the problem of ruling like a foreigner is not one of simply too much state and its unchecked repressive apparatuses, the police, jails, surveillance networks, which amnesty campaigns emphasize. Nor is it a straightforward lag or holdover from the colonial period expressed in neat allegorical parallels between the Dutch and the Suharto regimes. More accurately, the novel is an aesthetic investigation into the dialectical structures of repetition and newness. Let me discuss this by reference to two of the novel's literary strategies. First, Pangamanan's Sisyphean labor of keeping tabs on the many nascent native organizations, reform movements, unions, and women's groups that are blossoming across the archipelago is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it is evidence of the long arm of, the, of state surveillance and repression, his house of glass. On the other, however, under the guise of Pangamanan's surveillance labor, the reader is paradoxically offered a rich ethnography of the Indies' emergent political society rendered in its transnational historical con context. We thus learn of the Indo-European Indish Party, 
uh, and other political parties, including Budi Otomi, the moderate reform movement promoting, promoting native education, um, and the Indies Democratic Association, which is established in exile. In one memorable scene, Pangamanan's own nephew urges him to join a new Sarakat Manado, one of the many regional ethnic organizations sprouting up, much to the police officer's discomfort. Meanwhile, Minki's Sarakat Islam, the Islamic Union, the prime target of the government, is described as a veritable force of nature, quote, a great wave formed by the ocean of life, which had been whipped into a storm by new modern ideas and ways, end quote. At the level of narrative form, the proliferation of native organisations is expressed in the preponderance of minor characters. Despite Pangamanan's dogged efforts at cataloguing all these new leaders, the narrative refuses to sustain focus on any one of Minky's successes, as the reader might expect. Pangamanan himself complains, the situation was not getting any simpler at all. New figures emerged and disappeared, but there were also names that did not go away. Surjo Pranoto, Jojo Pranoto, Sostro Cardono, Sostro Cartono, Gonawan, Gunadi, Sukandav, Sukendav. I could hardly tell one from the other, no less than 90 names. Pangaman's distress is echoed by the reader, who similarly has trouble keeping track of the multiple minor characters and narrative threads which refuse to coalesce. Indeed, the novel strains to contain the stories of all 90 or so budding leaders, registering the groundswell of different movements at the level of literary form itself. These multiple leaders suggest that the true protagonist of House of Glass is neither Minky nor his antagonist Pangamanon, but the forging of the space of political activity itself. The technique of focusing on minor characters yields one further literary effect. In one chapter, Pangamanan must study the writings of one of the Sarakat's emerging leaders, Marco Carto di Cromo, which have been seized from a newspaper office. The investigation into Marco's autobiographical writings provides the occasion for a detour into the hardship suffered by peasants under the Dutch agrarian policy of Kultur Stezel, or culture system, introduced in 1830. And this was basically a forced labor system um, for plantations that grew crops for export. Um, but it's not only Dutch colonial rule that is indicted for its racialized labor exploitation. The colonial state colludes with foreign, often British, oil companies that effectively controlled labor and land distribution in the rural areas. As Marco puts it, quote, in the government, there was also an oil government and the people of our village had to obey both of them. From being free farmers, they had been turned into coolies of their former guests, end quote. Marco's embedded autobiography demonstrates Pramudia's skillful use of framed narratives and historical fiction to simultaneously look back from the novel's diegetic present to the Kultur Stezel period, while also looking forward to firmly indict the 1970s and 80s of the New Order. Such a framing forces us to ask, what structures of imperial power, economic, political, social, have been reactivated in the Cold War conjuncture? This repetition with a difference allows us to recall the way Suharto's regime was crucially supported by American, British and Japanese foreign investment and access to global markets, especially during its oil boom in the 1970s. More precisely, as Andrew Rosser has pointed out, the New Order's victory of counter-revolutionary violence meant it could act, quote, in a manner conducive to the interests of capital in general and recruit back colonial era economic players after Sukarno's efforts to nationalize the economy, end quote. House of Glass thus functions as both a piercing indictment of the longevity of colonial capitalist state structures in the post-colony, but also of the way such structures are actively revived by Cold War economic and geopolitical alignments. Literary freedom in this rendering is not simply about freedom of consciousness from the state, as per the amnesty campaigns, but the freedom to figure historical material in a way that engenders new ways to think the state in its wider political and social entanglements. Pramudia's writings are not primarily an expression of individual artistic consciousness that must remain untouched by state power, but is the attempt to reimagine the very condition of moving toward liberation. All right, and then the last part on Kim Chi Ha. In the Cold War Western press, the Korean Solzhenitsyn, Kim Chi Ha, was lauded as another dissident hero speaking truth to an oppressive regime. 
author of the scandalously satirical narrative poem Five Bandits or Jok, published in 1970 in the journal Sasangir, which was subsequently shut down, South Korea's representative poet famously earned the wrath of the Park Jung-hee military dictatorship. Born in 1941, the poet, whose nom de plume, Jiha, literally means underground, was in and out of prison for most of the late 1960s and 70s and sentenced to death in 74 for speaking out about the regime's use of torture. He was eventually pardoned after Park's assassination and the regime change in 1979. Charged with violating the state's anti-communist laws, as well as President Park's emergency decree number nine, prohibiting anti-government criticism, Kim's arrest and very public trial in 1976 spurred an international outcry. For US liberals, Kim's trial was one of the great scandals of Cold War Pacific alliances and highlighted what Yongju Ryu has called a central paradox, that is, quote, the show trials and the blatant violation of liberal democratic ideas were taking place not in the communist North Korea, as one might expect, but in the anti-communist South Korea, end quote. Ryu observes with irony, Solzhenitsyn would have found his great writer in Kim ji ha I suggest we read Kim's Five Bandits, uh, and in the full chapter I also examine Groundless Rumours, PR, uh, for the way its aesthetics brings to life not just the paradoxically rep repressive nature of the US-backed Park regime, but the more scandalous compatibility between capital's development and the present savagery, as the international press put it, of the Park regime. Turning to Five Bandits, we should recognize the novelty of the genre Kim called Damshi or talk poem, which draws from pansori elements, a traditional form of folk opera, as well as shaman rituals and vernacular slang in a free verse arrangement. U Chanje has defied Damshi as an open genre in which narrative and poetry, drama and song, lyric and epic, drama and epic can mix and interact freely. Damshi is thus the ideal form for representing the larger than life figures of the Park regime while drawing on traditional Korean genres of song and verse. The poem itself is something of an identikit of the authoritarian state. Recalling that the phrase five thieves or jok was used to characterize the five government ministers who in 1910 signed over Korean sovereignty to the Japanese, the five titular subjects are clearly neo-colonial agents for Kim. They are the conglomerate businessman, Chebol, or conglomerate, the National Assembly member, Kuke Iwan, or Assembly Mutt, the high-ranking government official, Koko Kongmuwan, or top civil serpent, uh, the, min the military general, Chang Song, or general in chimp, and the government minister, Chang Chaguan, or high minister. And I'm using um, the excellent 2015 translation by Brother Anthony of Taizé, which manages to, um, to actually translate the puns that Kim created um, in the, with the Chinese characters, the, with the um, Sino-Korean characters. Ostensibly, the occasion for the poem is the gathering of the five thieves as they meet to celebrate 10 years in the thievery business with a golf match. The gathering is the opportunity for an extended, grotesque and satirical description of these five branches of the authoritarian state and their various talents. First under scrutiny is the chebol or business magnate, synonymous with those enormously powerful conglomerates like Samsung, Hyundai and Lucky Gold Star, which took off during the Park jung hee period. Accordingly, the chebol gobbles down foreign investment and tax money while seducing young girls. The remaining four thieves are described in similarly withering terms. The assembly member shouts out nonsensical slogans to stupid citizens such as revolution, new wrongs for old. Meanwhile, top civil serpent specializes in taking bribes. The military general steals his soldiers rice and fills the sacks with sand. And the minister demands an ever higher export pro productivity as he embezzles money on government contracts. Kim's de depiction of the high minister is particularly grotesque. He emerges with glaring eyes veiled by disgusting mucus. His left hand conducts the national defense with a golf club. His right hand fumblingly scrawls production, export, construction, Jungsan, Suchul, Konso on a girl's breast. Ha ha, hey, hey, that tickles, sir. You ignorant bitch, how dare you say that affairs of the state tickle? Export though people starve, produce though nothing sells, 
Use the bones of those who've died of hunger to build a bridge to Japan. Let's go over and greet their gods. Kamisama Bea Haja. In images such as the misogynist minister, Kim mobilizes the Damshi form to succinctly encode the material logic undergirding the miracle of Korean industrialization. The reliance on foreign loans, the unrelenting pursuit of export dollars, fierce anti-communism, labor repression, low and low domestic consumption levels, in part enabled by the use of young female factory labor. One telling poetic result is the renewed aesthetic relevance of the commodity form. I suggest that in Five Thieves or Five Bandits, modern consumer goods, the shoes, electronics, and textiles produced by Koreans for the world market, as well as the Western commodities, which began to trickle in at this time, often through American black, black markets, take on an aura and authority of their own. Indeed, the description of the bandit's time and space stretching mansion actually takes up more lines in the poem than the descriptions of the five thieves themselves. Although most critical attention has focused on the personal satires of the latter, I suggest the poem is as interested in the arrangement and description of things as in their owners, inspecting the regi regime's material economy in exhaustive poetic detail. In the setup to the following quote, the chief of police hears of the royal decree for the arrest of the thieves and naively goes to their mansion, intent on capturing them and becoming a hero. As soon as he arrives, however, he is instantly seduced by its decadent architecture and amenities. And I'm not going to read all this. Um, it goes on for, for pages and pages, but just so you can get a sense of the kind of outrageousness of um, the mansion itself. And it's arranged in these sort of breathless run on lines. And the result is a kind of unnaturally proliferating and decidedly hybrid consumer culture. The Sony recorder in a marquetry chest, the Mitchell camera on a tortoise shell table and so on. These imaginary objects function as material sediments of several kinds of authority at once. Pre-modern kings, colonial rulers, and the specific Cold War character of South Korea's development. Five Bandits must therefore be read simultaneously as a damning satire of the corrupt personages of the Park regime and as a cutting political economic critique of South Korea's incorporation into the capitalist free world bloc. But otherwise, what is most scandalous about Kim's poem is the way bipolarized national development so closely resembles colonial exploitation. As in Indonesia, such repression is neither the generic fall into the totalitarian savagery of a police state, depicted by the Western press, nor is it simply due to the lingering after effects of colonial dictatorships. Tyranny here is a reactivated and reformed authority that emerges out of the growing material network of development schemes, investment apparatuses, anti-communist military loans, and the emerging transnational political economy of imports and exports. And I want to conclude my reading here, um, which is truncated, um, but uh, just to, to briefly note um, that the Western press was not the only keen outside observer of Kim's plight. And I don't have time to go into this fully now, but in 1975, Kim was awarded the prestigious Lotus Prize alongside the prominent third world writers, Chinua Achebe of Nigeria, Faiz Ahmad Faiz of pa Pakistan, and M. Mahdi El Gawari from Iraq. Uh, and this is the 1976 Lotus issue, which carried a brief author profile of Kim. And of course, the Lotus Journal, um, Afro-Asian Writings, um, comes out of the Afro-Asian Writers Bureau, which was itself um, directly inspired by the 1955 Bandung Conference. Uh, and in the profile, um, Kim is viewed uh, as, a, as a poet representing an exemplary struggle for national self-determination in a broader field of global politics. Uh, indeed, in 1977, one of Africa's most prominent writers, uh, who I've already mentioned, Gugiwa Thiongo, would use Kim's Five Bandits as a representative text to discuss neocolonialism. Gugi noted the inspiration for his 1980 Devil on the Cross as his encounter with Kim's work on a trip to Japan in 1976. In his essay, Africa and Asia, the history that refuses to be silenced, uh, he writes that the poem could be talking about many countries in Asia, South America and Africa. 
The bandits, a combination of business tycoons, top bureaucrats, national assemblymen, the top military brass and cabinet ministers, all the elements that make up the comprador social stratum are compared to the slave masters of old who drove people to work harder and harder with the resulting wealth going into the lifestyle of the few and their foreign connections in the centres of world imperialism. These bandits are reproduced by imperialism in a neo-colonial system engulfing the peoples of Asia, Africa and South America. So when he talks about the alliance of the five bandits with Japanese and US imperialism as helping in the plunder and murder of our peoples, he is speaking all our histories. These comments are so interesting, I think, because they return us to a moment before South Korea had emerged as an exceptional or model third world student rising to the ranks of industrialized nations, reminding us of the shared conditions that made possible that very rise and linking it to other decolonizing sites. For the great Kenyan writer, quote, the Korean people's struggle for democracy and unity is the struggle of all oppressed peoples, end quote. Like the Lotus editors, Gugi suggests a South-South solidarity that provocatively links post-colonial East Asia with Africa. In noting the use of anti-communist repression by both Africa and Asian authoritarian states, moreover, he is cognizant of the profound role of the global Cold War in shaping decolonization, a proce process that had devastating effects on the African continent as well as in Asia. My point in finishing with this brief other reception history of Kim's, Kim's work is to complicate the figure of the dissident writer and move beyond the typical focus in a Western version of human rights discourse on the violation of classical individual political and civil liberties. In sum, the Cold War literary imagination has often used the monolithic construct of the repressive communist or third world state against which to figure free speech, individual rights or tutelary democracy as its antidotes. Solzhenitsyn was the easiest shorthand for this model of reading. But the exemplary Cold War dissident writers I have examined, uh, for these writers, the capitalist developmental state demands a different representational logic, moving us beyond the two-person drama of transcendent artist versus police state. The writings of Pramudia, Kim and Roska help us trace the uneven fault lines between the decolonizing world the free world and the unfree Soviet bloc. In short, their works enable us to ask how the shorthand liberal notion of dissident writer has continued to shape our conceptions of 20th century dictatorship and authoritarianism and what they reveal about the subject of post-colonial freedom at this conjuncture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Watson for such wonderful talk. It was so nice to really um, follow your reading and, and, and also for the slides, they were so elucidating.